Well, welcome to Grace. Man, we're so glad that you're here. I, man, I'm just so excited. Those of you online, uh, thank you for tuning in, for being a part of our service today. Those of you in the house, come on, somebody. Y'all ready for God's word today? Yeah, I love it. I love that you guys are passionate about worship, love God's word. Um, and so we're starting the series, Listen Up, and what we're gonna do is listen to some of the legends of the Bible, listen to some of the heroes of our faith uh, that the Bible records their life and their story. And, and what I love about the idea of looking at some of these characters is they're just normal people like you and like me. And what we're gonna do is listen to their stories, listen to their challenges, listen to their failures, listen to their tough season, their pain, listen to their successes. And we're gonna be encouraged by God's word. I just want you to know this, getting God's word and God word, God's word is gonna breathe life to you. And so as we look to God's word today, man, I just want you to open up your heart and receive the word of God and receive the encouragement and the strength that the Lord wants for you today. Those of you at home, God's gonna meet you right where you are. Those of you in the house, I believe God's here and he's got a word for you today. Hebrews 12.1 says this right here. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the Bible refers to uh, some of those great men and women of faith that have gone before us in the word of God. And then the Bible says this, uh, since we're surrounded by a great cloud, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin. Let me just stop there. This isn't what we're preaching about, but I do want you to know this. There are things that sometimes we argue, show me why that's wrong, show me why that's sin. And the Bible here is clearly pointing out a difference between sin and the things that slow you down. And it's saying get rid of both. Like, yes, sin, sin, get it out of here. It separates us from God. But there are some things in our lives that are just weights, that are hindrances. It's not that they're necessarily sin, but the Bible says throw off those things. I mean, cast them away, the things that uh, hinder you and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance. This is the part I want you to lock in on. And let us run with perseverance. Let us run with perseverance. There's gonna be times you wanna quit. Let us run with perseverance. There's gonna be times that you fail and that you make mistakes and you fall. Let us run with perseverance. It means get back up. It means keep going. It means don't stop. Don't let a season, don't let a failure, don't let a mistake, don't let a choice, don't let what someone else says about you, don't let a bad, rough patch stop you from running the race that is marked out for us. And I want you to know that you have purpose, you have destiny in this place. And those of you that are watching online, those of you in the house, I want you to know when God created you, he created you for a purpose, to shine brightly for him. And I want you to step in to the race, to the purpose that God has for you. It's easy sometimes to measure ourselves against some of these giants of the faith, some of these men and women, and we kind of look at them like superheroes. But what I want you to understand is this, they're just fishermen. They're just tax collectors, man. They're just businessmen and women. Man, that's all they are. And they decided to follow Jesus. They decided to follow the Lord in their imperfection, in their flaws. And they just said one thing's for sure. We're just not gonna quit. We're gonna trust God. And as we jump into this series, we're gonna listen to their stories and listen to their failures, listen to their pain and their struggles and listen to their successes. But I want you to hear this throughout the entire series, and it's this thought right here. God specializes in using the unsure, insecure, and ordinary to do the impossible. Come on, how many of you hear that? Do you receive that? God's got a purpose for you to do miraculous things. And I know you may be a little unsure about your abilities. You may be a little insecure about your past. You may feel too normal and, and, and not special enough to be used by God. But I'm just here to tell you, God specializes in using the unsure, insecure, and ordinary. Where you're gonna find when we look in God's word this series is you're actually gonna look and see men and women that God used and is using in, in, in different ways in the midst of their struggles, even though they were ordinary, even though they may have been a little insecure, even though they failed, they got back up and God used them. And so today we're gonna lock in on this guy named Joseph. Everybody say Joseph. I think you're somewhat familiar with Joseph. Joseph was a man in the Old Testament and we're gonna kind of look at his story uh, throughout the word of God. Now, here's what you gotta know about uh, Joseph. His story actually takes up about half of the book of Genesis. So he is, he is like 
like all throughout Genesis, there is so much to talk about when we talk about Joseph. If we were gonna talk about his entire story, we'd be here till next Sunday and you'd never go home, right? Uh, and so we can't do that. But we're gonna jump through a little bit of his story and we're gonna let his story speak to us. And I wanna challenge you at home in this place, listen up to what his story shares to us. Listen up to what he is saying to us. Now, I wanna give you a little bit of background on Joseph. Um, and uh, I want to start by just telling you the genealogy of where Joseph came from, because who doesn't love genealogy, right? And so here it is, Abraham, do y'all know Father Abraham? He had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. Now, I want you to know, I'm one of them. Yeah, y'all know. Some of you don't know what just happened. All right. So. Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob, who actually begins to, his name changed to Israel, and then Jacob actually ended up having 12 sons, but at this point in the story, he has 11 sons, and his youngest son is Joseph. Now, this is important to know because Joseph's father, Jacob, is actually uh, very, like, has favor on Joseph more than his brothers. As a matter of fact, uh, he had preferential treatment from his father. At one point, Joseph's father gave him a coat of many colors and his brothers got nothing. Y'all know Jerry Springer? <laughs> Jerry Springer would have had a heyday up in this family, right? Like the brothers hated Joseph. Uh, Joseph thought he was great, had greatness on him. And, and his father really loved Joseph more than the others, and it was obvious. And so they had this moment where there was just some family drama. Then Joseph gets a dream from God. We're gonna look at that dream in just a minute. Joseph gets a dream from God, and his life ends up taking a vastly different route than what his dream said. Some of you know exactly what that's like. You're in this room, and God's given you a promise of your marriage. He's given you a promise of healing. He's given you a calling, a future to step into. He's called you to a ministry. He's called you to something that God wants to use you to, to, to give birth to or to a business to start. And God wants to use you to reach your loved ones for Jesus. And, and maybe your life right now is taking a vastly different turn than the promises of God. Here's all I want you to know today. Come on, don't give up on God's dream. Don't stop chasing after what God has called you to, what he's promised you, what he, is, what he has spoken over you. No matter where your life is headed right now, I want you to keep chasing this. So we look in Genesis 37. So if you have your Bible, paper Bible, keep it open. Uh, we're gonna be looking at several scriptures here today. Um, if you have your electronic Bible, open up Genesis 37. And this is where we're gonna read a little bit about Joseph, what we just kind of learned. Um, and this is the point at which Joseph had this dream. And let's take a look at this. Here we go in verses five of Genesis 37. It says, Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, watch this, they hated him all the more. They already hated him, now they really hate him. Uh, because here's the dream, the Bible says that they didn't like him. Uh, he said to them, listen to this dream I had. So Joseph tells them the dream. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. In other words, I'm about to be great. Y'all don't even know how great I am, Joseph's telling his brothers. And his brothers didn't react the way Joseph wanted, right? And Joseph continued, while your sheaves gather around my sheaf, they bowed down to it. In other words, man, listen, y'all need me. Y'all gonna be serving me one day, right? You're gonna be bowing to me one day. I'm about to be in high places, y'all. And so what happens between verses eight through 18 is the brothers start conspiring against Joseph. They're like, man, I'm sick of this. Dad's always like showing him favor, preferential treatment. Dad's always kind of, it's his favorite, obviously. And so we need to kill him, get him out of the picture so dad even knows that we exist. And so basically what happens, we jump back in here in verse 19, skip down and here's what it says. They said to him, here comes that dreamer, here comes that dreamer, right? And they said, come now, let's kill him. This is the brothers talking about Joseph. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of those cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. 
How many of you are grateful for your family now? Yeah. You thought you didn't like your relatives. And then the brother said, then we'll see what comes of his dreams. In other words, if we can derail his life, his dreams won't come true. Let's see what he thinks about his life now, now that it's not going the way that he thought. In other words, Joseph had this dream that he was going to be great, that God was going to use him, his brothers were going to bow down uh, to him, and he was going to be elevated, and the favor of God was going to be on his life. But from that moment on when he shared his dream, his life went in the opposite direction. And some of us know exactly what that's like. Some of you are here today, and you're praying for a miracle, and your life hadn't gotten any closer to seeing that miracle. Some of you have been praying for your marriage to be restored, and yet your marriage is drifting apart. What I'm here to tell you is don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on your walk with God. Don't give up on your calling. Don't give up on the promises of God. Just because your life looks like it's headed in the wrong direction, you've still got a choice. You've got a choice on how you respond to what happens to you and around you. And so it kind of reminds me of a documentary that I watched a few years ago. It was a documentary about a lion and I don't know how they knew, but I think they named this lion Simba. And uh, they knew who his dad was. His dad was Mufasa, and he was kind of the king, you know, of the area. And, and the king, Mufasa, had a brother named Scar. He was a little wicked. And they drew all this out in the, uh, in the documentary. It was pretty great. And... Uh, and, and so as, as Scar was jealous of Mufasa, and so actually Scar kills Mufasa, the bad one kills the king, and now this little, this little lion cub, Simba, he don't know what to do. His life, he thought, my dad's going to train me to be king. And then all of a sudden, now people are going to think he killed his dad. His life took a drastic turn from what he thought his life was going towards. And so Simba made a choice to run. And the documentary shows that he ran to a little place and he met two little friends. One was a little warthog. The other one was a meerkat. Pumbaa and Timon. Did I say that right, Ray? Sometimes I mix those names up. I got it right? Okay, Pumbaa and Timon. And they're out there and they're just friends. You know, they're just hanging out. And it took a red-butted monkey with a stick to come up and find Simba and whoop him upside the head and say, what are you doing? Get back over there and fight for what's yours. I just feel like today, if I could, I feel like God's called me to be a red-butted monkey. Tweet that. <laughs> I feel like God's called me to be a red-butted monkey that with the word of God and some truth today, I wanna beat some of us upside the head in a loving way and say, stand up and fight for your marriage. Don't quit on it. Stand up and fight for your calling. Don't give up on that. If God called you to something and you messed up and you failed and you fell and you, you, you derailed yourself, get up, brush yourself off, get back in God's will and start walking towards what God has promised you. Don't give up on the promises, the healing. Don't give up on the future that God has for you. See, God is speaking to some of you today and some of you, Man, it's like what you planned or what God has promised is nowhere near the vicinity of the reality in what you're facing. And maybe you're here and you're ready to check out relationally or check out spiritually, check out physically and, and, and even in your marriage and your calling, your dream, your hopes. I mean, you just can't believe for a miracle anymore. You can't believe for the dream anymore. I just want you to know from Joseph's story that Joseph's story is shouting to you today. It's shouting to me today. And it's saying, listen up. I'm here to tell you I've been through it. Man, my own family tried to kill me. Listen up. If my life and my story could say anything to you, this is what Joseph would say to you. Don't give up on your God dream. Get up and fight for your God dream. Don't lay down and take it. Don't give up on what God has said over you and spoken over you in the calling and the dream and the ministry and the healing. Get up and fight for your God dream. Now, when I look at Joseph's story, there's two parts. There's the dream. And there's the favor and the blessing that led up to this moment. But the second he shared his dream, there was nothing but a nightmare. And Joseph had 
a decision to make. Am I gonna give up and just walk away? Just because it's painful? Just because it's hard? Just because I messed up? Just because the season I'm in is in a season of struggle? Just because it's been years or a decade? Man, am I gonna give up believing? And God would say to you through the life of Joseph, don't give up. Get up and fight for your God dream. Fight for your God dream. Get back and get in what God has called you to. So we're gonna allow Joseph to speak to us today. Because some of you, you're in a season right now where you wanna give up in your marriage, where you wanna give up in your business, in your calling, in your future, in your ministry. Some of you, God's hand is on your life and you've walked away because you've messed up. And quit allowing failures to derail you from God's plan in your life. Quit allowing a tough season to stop you from believing and walking with faith. Brush yourself off. And some of you are here today and you're in that spot. Others of you are here and life's going great, but I'm just here to tell you there's gonna be a day where it's not. And in that tough season, what are you gonna do? You can go, well, can you be a little bit more positive? Yes, I can. I'm positive that one day you will find a tough season. And when you do, you got a decision to make. How you respond means everything. So let's look at God's word. You ready? Let's look at God's word and let Joseph's life challenge us in some areas. You ready? Here we go. Here we go. Number one, number one, Joseph would say this to you and me. His story would shout to us to listen up. Number one, don't give up even if things don't start off well. Come on, I know it hadn't started off well. You thought you were in it. You thought you were for it. You already told people you're going to do it. And then immediately you failed. Immediately you made a stupid decision. Immediately you started living for the flesh instead of the spirit. Immediately something happened to you. Immediately you got let go at your job. Immediately something happened. Listen, no matter how it started off, it can't have the power to change what God is still going to do. Just because it starts off bad, Joseph shows us, man. Look, it doesn't get much worse than this. God like, gave Joseph this dream that he would rise up and be a man of influence and power and that his own brothers would come around him and, and, and serve him. And yet from that moment, his dream did not start off well. And you know what you're gonna see when we look at these legends of the Bible? That the Bible is full of people, men and women, with horrible resumes. They shouldn't have got the job because of their mistakes, because of what they're going through, because of their talent, their abilities, their age, whatever it is. And can I just tell you, I don't care what your resume says, it cannot dictate God's promises. Your resume, your past cannot change God's healing, God's future, God's calling. Come on, some of you need to let, let, let the dryness and the doubt and the fear in your heart, let it come alive today with faith. Don't give up, even if it starts off pretty bad. See, a lot of us have stories that didn't start off well. And when you look in the rear view mirror of your life, man, all you see is everything but what God promised, what God spoke, what you're fighting for, what God asked you to start, what God asked you to do. And sometimes we only look at the past. And it's easy to think this. It's easy to think, well, I sinned, I messed it up. I, it's easy to think, well, man, you know, I made a mistake. Man, I, I, I'm, I messed up pretty bad, and it's just now I'm reaping what, I'm, what I sowed. Can I tell you that any time that you step out and you try to follow God's plan and promise and you start fighting for his purpose in your life, man, you got to realize that obedience has a cost. And any time you do that, not everything that's going on in your life is a direct result of your failure or your sin. Could it be? Sure. Absolutely. The Bible teaches us that. But also, not everything bad is tied to that. And I want you to know, sometimes we just walk through, Joseph didn't do anything wrong, and his brothers tried to kill him. His story did not start off well. Nothing like the dream. He gets sold into slavery, thrown into a pit to die, sold into slavery. Here's what I'm trying to tell some of you today when you're looking around your life in your rearview mirror. For some of you, it's really recent. I want you to understand this. Your past doesn't get to define your future. The past mistakes of your marriage does not get to define the future of your marriage. Your past mistakes in business does not get to define your future. Your past mistakes in your walk with God does not get to define your calling in your ministry with God. God's got grace and mercy. Here's the problem though. The devil likes to take what we've done and what's happened to us and start throwing it at us. 
and start whispering to us, man, you know you can't do it. Man, you know that you've already messed up too bad. No one's even going to have faith in you. Already, you already know your marriage is over. You already, if God was going to fix it, he would have already done it. And so the devil likes to lie and whisper. It's like the guy that walked into the pet store and he walks around the pet store shopping and there's this parrot in the back in a cage and the parrot goes, Psst. The guy turns around, looks at him and, and, and says, did you just Psst me? The parrot goes, yeah, come here. The guy walks over to the parrot and the parrot looks at him, pointed his little wing at him and said, you're the ugliest thing I've ever seen. The guy goes, well, that was rude, stormed out of the store. A couple weeks later, he goes back to the same store. Parrot's still back there. He walks in. The parrot recognizes, goes, Psst. hey, you, you here again? The guy goes, yeah, I'm here again. Come here. Walks over to the parrot. The parrot goes, you're the ugliest thing I've ever seen. The guy goes, that's it. I've had it. You've insulted me for the last time. Goes to the pet store owner, tells the pet store owner, your parrot keeps insulting me. I've been here multiple times. He's rude. And I'm not going to come back here unless you deal with it. The pet store owner goes, I got this. Walks over there, opens the cage, pulls the parrot out, slaps him upside his parrot beak, puts him back in a cage, shuts it and says, don't you ever say that to my customer again. If you say those words again, you're going to be a dead parrot. Guy leaves, comes back a few weeks later, walks in the store, walking around. The parrot goes, hey. Guy looks at him, goes, you talking to me? He goes, yeah, come here. Guy walks over to the parrot, and the guy goes, what? And the parrot goes, you know what. <laughs> Can I tell you what the enemy's really good at? You know what. He's really good at whispering, you know what you did. You know the choices you made. You know how you've been sleeping around. You think God could use you? You think God could redeem your marriage? He's really good at pointing an accusing finger at you and throwing your past right at you. You know what? You're not talented enough. You're broken. Look at the choice. Look at what's happened to you. You ain't got the talent or the money or this or that to make a difference. You don't have the influence. But can I just tell you, you need to quit listening to the lies of the enemy and lean into the truth of God. Don't give up even if things don't start off well. Here's the point. Regardless of a bad season, you can still have a God story. God's not done writing your story. God's not done writing what he's gonna write. He's still gonna fulfill his promises. He's still, if you won't give up, he will still do what he's called you to do. He can still restore. He can still heal. He can still bring about. He can still paint a beautiful future and a ministry for you. You gotta lean in. Don't give up, Joseph would say. That's why 1 Timothy, we see the Apostle Paul. Y'all remember the Apostle Paul? Before he was the Apostle Paul, he was the Apostle Awful. He actually blasphemed, he was persecuting, he killed Christians, like he was vocal against God. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter seven, he actually ordered the stoning of Stephen. Now, this wasn't like the stoning, it wasn't that stoning. It was like the stoning where they put you on a wall and throw, throw literal rocks at you, and so he, he literally ordered the stoning of Stephen. And then God got a hold of him. How many of you are glad there's a but God moment in our lives, right? And then he writes this in 1 Timothy chapter 1. This is the same guy. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me. In other words, he's saying this. He's saying, man, who am I? You know how much I've messed up? He's saying, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me faithful. That he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though, watch, I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, watch this, I was shown mercy. Here's what I'm here to tell you, whether it's your fault or not, if it didn't start off well, God is a God of mercy and grace and his plans, his future, his calling for you has not changed. Don't give up. Even if things didn't start off well, number two, Joseph would tell us this, don't give up even if your journey is full of surprises. Life has a way sometimes when you wake up, 
rugs pulled out from under you. It's like one minute it's good, the next minute it's bad. Then the next minute, it's like, it's like a yo-yo. You're up and down and life has a way of, of like financially messing with you, marriage messing with you, just your future, your mistakes, and, and it's like up and then down and then I feel and then I'm not. And then it's like, y- y'all remember when uh, Houston had Six Flags Astroworld? Y'all remember that? Yeah, you remember? I, I don't know what happened there. Like, that was the devil. But like, uh, Astroworld like was awesome. Had a black top, so it was hotter, you know, than maybe hell would be. I don't know. It, it was hot. And uh, it just sticky. It was awesome, actually. And, and like you're there, and they had all these roller coasters. Y'all remember the roller coasters? And uh, they had this one roller coaster, Accelerate. Y'all remember this? Accelerate, you hung from the track. You didn't sit in a car. You actually hung, uh, and, and it would just like throw you left, right, and it would just kind of toss you around. And then there was the Ultra Twister. Anybody remember that one? That was just like you were in an encased, closed track and the train would go straight but it would just twist you like this you would just be twisting as you go straight it was insane Uh, and then they had uh, the viper which had a giant dark tunnel and you'd come out of it and just immediately drop and then they had the greased lightning somebody needs a greased lightning up in here y'all remember that one that was my favorite growing up it would shoot you from zero to like 300 it wasn't that much but it was close Uh, uh, in a matter of like a second and it would you do a loop and you'd go to the top of the track and it felt like you were gonna fly off, especially if you were in the front car. Track ended. And then it would just stop and then it would go backwards. You'd do the loop backwards. You couldn't even see what was happening. It was crazy. And then they had the death trap of all roller coasters, the Texas Cyclone. At one point, the tallest peak and the steepest drop. I mean, it threw you all around. You'd leave needing a neck brace, a back brace, crutches, like you needed all of it because of this roller coaster. And it would throw you around and it was, it was about two and a half minutes, it was a long roller coaster. Can I tell you, life has a way of being like a roller coaster. There's ups, there's hills, there's dark tunnels and you come out of it and right when you think everything's fine, it drops you, there's loops, there's backward loops, you don't even know what's hitting you. Life sometimes, your marriage, your decisions, your choices, financially, you got let go. What happens around the world, it feels like it's throwing you left and right and life is a lot like a roller coaster. Joseph's journey was a lot like a roller coaster, full of twists, full of, uh, of disorienting things that happened to him, and yet he never gave up. There were highs and there were lows. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Journey, Joseph's journey was full of surprises, and it was full of give up moments. As a matter of fact, uh, Joseph uh, had this dream. It was a high moment. He thought, man, God's taking me somewhere. But then uh, he was misunderstood by his family, uh, which immediately was a drop. And then he was hated by his brothers. He was thrown into a pit to die. Talk about a loop. And then he was sold into slavery to Potiphar. And then he lived, had to go move to a strange country far from his home, away from his family, and live in isolation. And then he was given favor in Potiphar's house. It was like the roller coaster went back up for Joseph and he goes to the top and he becomes the chief of staff. Things are turning around already. And then all of a sudden he's falsely accused by Potiphar's wife of trying to sleep with him. That whole thing was messed up. And then he had to run for his life. High moment, immediately another drop. Being thrown left to right. He was thrown into prison because of it. He was put in charge of all the prisoners, which is great. But then he realized, I'm still in prison, which is bad. And then he goes down, and then he, he, he comes in contact with uh, the chief cupbearer, who has a dream, and he needs to interpret it. So Joseph says, I can interpret it for you. He interprets the dream. And the guy goes, oh, my word, this is amazing. What can I do for you, Joseph? And Joseph says, just remember me. Get me out of this prison. The guy goes, absolutely, I will remember you. Well, the guy doesn't remember him. He's forgotten. You ever felt forgotten? Pushed to the side. And and this is what happened to Joseph. So he spent a few more years in prison. Messed up. And then he interpreted a dream for Pharaoh, predicted like a seven-year famine, like storing grain. All the nations would come to him. They'd get rich from it. uh, And they would find wealth and blessings because of it. And he became the second in command of all of Egypt. What I want you to notice as I go through Joseph's story is this. There were twice as many give-up moments as there was go-on moments. If anybody had a reason that their journey could have been like, he could have jumped out of his journey, jumped out of his calling, jumped out of his promise and his dream. It was Joseph because of all the surprises. Here's what I'm here to tell you today. Listen, you may have twice as many give up moments going on in your life as you have go on moments, but God is still working. 
Can somebody just hear the word of God? He's working on your marriage. Your whole job is this, don't give up. He's working on your future, your calling, your ministry. I promise you, man, he's working on that healing. He's gonna come through. He's gonna provide a job. He's gonna do it. Don't quit when life throws you a curveball, a hard moment, a season that is full of surprises. Romans 8 says this, and we know in verse 28 that in all things, everybody say all, God worked for the good of those who loved him who have been called according to his purpose. See, God doesn't always cause it, but he can use it. And what I want you to see is even the surprise moments, the valley moments, the twist moments, the loop moments, the backwards moments, through all the surprises, the ups and downs, the roller coasters that life can deal you, God is still working and he can turn it for your good. Don't let the downs rob you of God's promises by quitting. So number one, don't give up even if things don't start off well. Number two, don't give up even if your journey is full of surprises. Number three, don't give up even if those closest to you don't support you. Man, life is full of haters. People that say you can't, you won't, it shouldn't, not you, not your past. And sometimes negative feedback just kind of lays on us like a heavy weighted blanket And it's hard for us to see anything other than the weight of the words of those closest to us. And I want you to see that the people that hurt Joseph the most were actually those closest to him that he helped. His own brothers, his own family turned their back on him and spoke evil and said, let's kill him, let's sell him. Potiphar's wife, he was helping Potiphar. He was working with Potiphar. His own wife turned and then accused him of something that wasn't even true. And then as he goes on, he gets ignored and forgotten by the chief cupbearer. Listen, those closest to you will not always support what's happening in you. They will not always support your calling. Now, a lot of them will. And like, I thank God for those people. But can I tell you, do not place weight on the words of the enemy. You gotta listen to the calling and the promises and the blessing of God. Man didn't call you to it, God did. Man didn't give you the dream, God did. Man didn't promise you the breakthrough, God did. Man didn't call you to that future, God did. Man didn't make the plan, God did. Quit listening to those who don't support you. I mean, we used to do this uh, with the girls, we used to do this weekly game night. And we'd do it on Sunday nights and for years. I mean, it was like four or five years we did this game night and we'd pull out a game and it was a long season where we played Uno. Y'all remember that game Uno? Draw four, draw two, all the kind of messed up cards, you know? And, uh, and so I got two daughters, Avery and Jordan, and some of you know Jordan. She's the sweetest thing in the world, but not at the card table. She is evil as evil gets, man. Dagger, you think she's nice. Play cards with her. She ain't nice no more. That girl didn't care about winning. She only wanted to mess you up. That's it. She'd care less if she won. She just didn't want you to win. She wanted you to hurt and have a little bit of pain when you do it. And so we'd play Uno, and she would collect all the draw fours and draw twos, and she would lay all of her regular numbers on the table and only hold those, but she'd hold them backwards so everybody at the table could see her. She was just showing you, draw four, draw two, who wants it? And whoever was there, sometimes she'd play a reverse just so she could hurt the person on her other side. She didn't care. She just wanted to hurt you. She didn't care about winning. She just wanted to do anything. She, she thought the funnest part of the game was simply making other people lose. Can I tell you, there are people in your life that are the exact same way. They don't want you to get ahead of them. They don't want you to win. They just want to speak about all the reasons why you can't. I don't care how many people tell you you can't. I'm just here to tell you God can. Some of you are buying into the lie that it can't be fixed, it can't be healed, it can't be done, the provision will not come. I'm just here to tell you, and this is so important, how you respond to the tough seasons changes everything. Your response to offenses often determines your route through obstacles. How are you responding in the hard season? How are you responding when life kicks you in the teeth? How are you responding when you make a mistake? How are you responding when you derail yourself and head down a selfish road? How are you responding when something happens at work that isn't fair? 
How you respond determines the route through the obstacles. See, Joseph, as weird as it is when you read the story, most of Genesis, what you're going to find is he responded the right way. You don't find him wanting revenge. You don't find him trying to figure out a way to get back at Potiphar's wife or his brothers or, or anyone else that knew or even the chief. You don't find him wanting to come back at those people. You find this. In the end, Joseph always responded going, I still believe. I still believe. And I'm going to continue to believe for the miracle. I'm going to believe for the dream. I'm going to believe for the promise. I'm going to believe that my marriage can be restored. Even through it all, he simply believed for it. And at one point at the very end of the story in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, we find that Joseph is standing before his brothers. His brothers don't recognize him. In 20 years, he's dressed like an Egyptian. He's got makeup on like an Egyptian, so he's kind of hidden and masked. And it's 23 years later. And yet in this moment, Joseph says this to his brothers. Look at how he responds to the tough season. You intended to harm me. And you could almost see a smile come on his face as he lays his hand, but God intended it for good. In other words, here's what he's saying. Nothing can stop the dream. Nothing can stop the promise of God. Nothing can stop the healing that God has already spoken that it will come. Nothing can change the, the ministry and the calling on your life if you will just, instead of giving up, you'll get up and you'll fight for your God dream. So don't give up, even if things start off, don't start off well. Don't give up, even if your journey is full of, don't give up. Listen, some of you today, you need this breath of encouragement. Come on, you need, you need somebody. You need the red-butted monkey. That's me, baby. Don't give up. Go back and fight for the God dream in your life. Even if those closest to you don't support you. And the last thing I want to hit is this thought from his story. Don't give up, even if it's taken a long time to happen. Oh, Sometimes it takes too long. See, I want you to see this. You can trust God in the process. Most of us want microwave blessings, microwave miracles, microwave answers. And God can and does do that. I'm not saying he doesn't. But I am saying this. Sometimes it takes a little longer than you want and a little longer than you think. Sometimes it takes decades and years and months. And you've been praying for a healing for your kid. I mean, you've been believing for something to change with your financial situation. You've been, you've been, you've been praying for your ministry opportunity for something to open up. You've been praying for your family to come back to Jesus. You've been praying for your kid that's walked away from his faith. Can I just tell you today, even if it's taken a long time, keep believing for the miracle. Joseph never doubted the miracle. I want you to understand this. When Joseph was 17 years old, he got the dream and his brothers tried to kill him and threw him in the pit. 23 years later, at age 40, he's now standing in front of his brothers. 23 years it took from the promise to the fulfillment of the promise, from the dream to the fulfillment of the dream. I don't care if it's been decades. God's word is true. His promises are yes and amen, and he will not turn back on what he has spoken. Just don't give up. Here's what you need to know. God is more interested in your character than your comfort. And sometimes we want the comfort of the season. God just wants the character being built in the season. That's why James 1 says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kind, whether it's your doing or someone else's, because you know that the testing of your faith, watch this, develops you, develops perseverance. See, we pray oftentimes, God, get me out of this season. Get me out of this hurt, this pain. Get me out of this thing that's broken. I just want us to add a little bit to that prayer. Can we do that? God, Help me to get out of this what you want me to get out of this. Help me to get out of this and to grow in the middle of this what you want me to grow in, what you want me to get out of this season. In other words, you gotta focus on what happens in you more than what happens to you. Habakkuk 2 tells us this, and listen, this is a word for some of you. For the revelation waits an appointed time. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks to the end. It will not prove false. In other words, God's promise is God's promise. The revelation, the dream, the promise, the fulfillment, the vision. What God has spoken of you, his ministry, his calling. It 
It will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. Even if it's taken a long time, wait for it. Don't give up. Some of you are on the verge of giving up. Don't give up on your calling. Don't give up on your healing, on your provision. Do not give. You came here today. You're watching online today for me to tell you. I'm telling you, don't give up. God sent me here with this word, don't give up. And then the Bible says this, it will certainly come and it will not delay. It was in 2002 that a guy by the name of Emmett Smith, you may know Emmett Smith, you may not. Emmett Smith plays or played for the Dallas Cowboys. I'm really sorry. He played for the Dallas Cowboys, and it was in 2002. And I'll never forget, I was watching it live, that Emmett became the all-time leading rusher in the history of the NFL. Still stands to this day. Now, that may not impress you, but no one else has been able to do what Emmett did with this. No one else has been able to run as far as Emmett ran. And in 2002, I remember watching the thing. My wife wanted to go on this seven-day cruise. We went on the seven-day cruise, and as the cruise got closer, I started realizing this could be the Sunday that Emmett's going to break the record. And so I told my wife, like a loving husband would, I'll be yours six days and 20 hours. I just need three hours to watch this game. I got to watch this, this record. She goes, absolutely, you know. And so I go watch the game. Everybody in the restaurant is just booing Emmett the whole time. He's a loser. He ain't no good. Here he is about to break the record, right? I'll never forget the play. They are playing the Seattle Seahawks. They hike the ball. They give it to Emmett on the left side. Emmett takes the ball, runs through the left side of the line, and he cuts back to the right, and he starts stumbling. Some of you watch this play live. And he stumbles, and he starts kind of putting his hand on the ground and trying to get every yard he could, and then he dove at the end. And he got like 18, 19 yards on that play. And then the game stopped because he became the all-time leading rusher. No one carried this ball further. And then everybody that was booing him, it go, well, he is pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, congrats. Got to give it up for the dude, right? Hate him or love him, no one carried this ball further. Eight years later, Emmett played a few more years in the NFL carrying this thing. And then he got inducted in the Hall of Fame. And I watched that live as he got inducted in the Hall of Fame. And I'll never forget when they introduced him. They threw some stats up on the screen. And it was impressive. And here's what they threw up on the screen. 18,355 rushing yards. 4,409 rushing attempts. 164 touchdowns. And as I begin to look at that stat and listen to it, Something happened, and I saw it in a different way. He ran this ball 18,355 yards, further than anybody ever had. But that wasn't the most impressive part to me. The most impressive part to me was 4,409 rushing attempts and only 164 rushing touchdowns. That means... He carried this ball 4,409 times, and 4,245 times he was either hit, tackled, or had to run out of bounds because he couldn't go any further. In other words, 4,245 times he did not score a touchdown. It was not a success. It was this. Do you know that over 600 times he was hit behind the line of scrimmage and knocked to the ground? Do you know 60 different times he was hit so hard he fumbled the ball and cost his team? Some of you know what, knows what it's like. You know what it's like to fumble and to make a mistake. You know what the difference was with Emmett? Emmett wasn't the strongest. He wasn't the fastest. He wasn't, he wasn't the most elusive or shiftiest player that there was. It just means this. Emmett, 4,245 times, ran back to the huddle and said, man, I didn't get it, but give me the ball again. I'm going to try again. 60 times he fumbled this thing. He had to go get it. He made a mistake. But he kept picking the ball back up, going back to the huddle, looking at his coach, looking at his quarterback and said, give me the ball again. I won't let you down this time. In other, in other words, there were sometimes he was hit 500 times behind the line of scrimmage and he would get tackled and he would be laying under a pile of men and he had to decide, am I going to stay down? Am I going to quit? Am I going to retire? Am I just going to 
chalk this game up as a loss or am I going to get back up? Am I going to go back and am I going to look at him and I'm going to say, give me the ball again. Give me the ball again. Give it to me again. Some of you need to get up off the turf and you need to say, give me the ball again. Some of you need to get up out of your seat and you need to say, I'm going to fight for my marriage. I'm going to fight for my calling. I'm going to fight for my faith. I'm not giving up believing for my miracle. God has promised a calling on my life. He has promised a breakthrough. He has promised provision. He has promised, and I will not quit. Though the enemy tackles me, though the enemy makes me make a mistake and I fumble the ball, though I fail, I will pick the ball back up and I will say, give me the ball. I will continue to believe for my miracle. I will continue to fight for my kids who don't serve you. I will continue to believe for restoration in my marriage. Come on, somebody, you gotta believe for it. Four thousand, four hundred and nine times he ran. Eighteen thousand three hundred and fifty-five yards. Do the math. I just did it backstage. That's 4.1 yards per carry. Nothing flashy about 4.1 yards. But what this speaks to is what Hebrews 12 challenges you and me to. Let us run with perseverance. Let us run with perseverance. Let us run with perseverance. Don't give up just because it hadn't started off well. Don't give up just because it's taken a long time. Don't give up because of what other people's. Don't give up because of your stupid choices. Don't give up. Come on, don't give up. Just because the ups and downs of life. Don't give up. God's promises are yes and amen. There is restoration coming for you. There is healing coming for you. If God spoke it over you, it's true. You can bank on it. All you've got to do is not quit. 